Okay, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. Uh, you guys are going to be shocked. We've got two ladies in a row, two podcasts in a row. We've got a female on, finally. People are starting to think I was a bit sexist there, Emma, but I'm not. <laughs> I've been trying to get people on for a long time. And I want to start straight away that I think what you're doing is great because there's way too many men in the industry, right? And to have a female lawny on YouTube, it's like, where have you been? You know, like we need more of that in the industry, more people who love that sort of stuff. Thanks for coming on. How are you feeling? You been excited? I am. I'm pumped. I love a good chat about a lawn. So I think, I think we'll have some fun. We'll start straight away with the being as far as I'm aware, I don't know anybody else who is a female lawn YouTuber. That might just be me, but like in the world, I mean, I know I'm not like super researching this or anything, but there's so many American guys out there. There's one or two British people out there. There's a bunch of Aussies and I get all these recommendations from YouTube because I watch this sort of stuff. And Anyways, that's what triggered you know my interest. I was like, "There's a lady who's doing this, sweet!" Like, and so yeah, I, are you the only one? Is there other people out there? I don't know. You probably know uh, more I than me. Pro- I should probably know the answer to that, and I don't. And but yeah, now that you mention it, because I don't, I don't really think of it like that. But um, I watch a lot of YouTube lawnies, and yep. yeah, now that you've mentioned it, they're all men. Um, but I've never, that's never really registered. It's never stood out as being different. I know that there's um, girls lawn in America. I think she does quite well. I don't know if she's on YouTube. I probably don't know enough about her, to be honest. I've seen her on Insta, but I haven't checked it out if it's on YouTube or not. There's a couple of, there's a lot of gardening uh YouTubers who are female. And I find specifically like with veggies and things like that, um, but yeah, lawn, lawn seems to be, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe it's because it's a sport thing. People love sport and you know, I don't, that's just seems to be on average, more guys get interested in that. I don't know. I mean, not that I'm getting into the politics of anything. I just find it fascinating that you're, you're doing what you're doing because you seem to be an outlier. Yeah. I, I think you mentioned, you mentioned sport and that's probably, what's probably influenced me the most is I was very, very sporty kid growing up. And so Mm -hmm. I could, you know, appreciate a good sports field, a good, a good footy field, MCG stripes, loved cricket growing up and everything. Um, So, yeah, I think being sporty sort of, I saw that well, but also I, I think that men are a little bit reluctant to give up the mowing because they love it so much. Yeah, like I could never and, mow. I could never mow the lawn as a kid because Dad would never let me. And the one time that he did let me, he basically stood there and told me what I was doing wrong. So yeah, yeah. it's so possessive of it. You can't even if yeah, you try. Exactly. To, you can't allow anybody to help you in that area. Yeah, there's this way in the right way. So I, I don't know if you've seen. You probably have those. There's a bunch of those reels on Instagram and TikTok and stuff where the wife discovers that the ride on mowing outside is actually like such a good getaway. And it's like the husband's been hiding us for years. They sit on the mower, yeah. put their headphones on and just sort of zone out from the world. And the wife's inside not realizing what she's missing out on. That's it. That's it. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to clean to feel like you've achieved something or get a little bit of a break. And yeah, there's, it's a big thing. Like being a, uh, I have two young daughters and yeah. I love them, love them to death. And then sometimes it's just, I just want to go out and mow the lawn. I, I there, would rather yeah. hear a motor than, <laughs> than, than, than another rendition of, um, of <laughs> baby shark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, that literally is what my wife did yesterday. Like, cause we've got, um, we've got a verge, that was really overgrown. And um, for the business, we've got like a hustler stand on mower. And uh, she loves, my life, My wife loves using any ride on lawn mower. Really, like the walk behind stuff, not so interested. Like I remember we, her family lives out in the country. They've got a farm and she was pregnant and she's mowing this 
this open field with a John Deere zero turn and it's so bumpy and everything like that. Yeah. It's so <laughs> dusty. Uh, it's like, it's not a nice oval. It's like nice and flat and enjoyable. And she loves it, you know, like when she goes out there. So anyway, I was, um, yesterday afternoon, there's probably about 20 minutes or 30 minutes of mowing to do. And she's out there mowing the lawn and I'm looking after the kids. <laughs> it's, it's like, she did not want me to get involved with all like, <laughs> which I understand. Yeah. This is my time. <laughs> I get that. Do you, do you ever get with the YouTube stuff? Cause like, I mean, people are idiots on the internet, right? And they they say things that they would never say in, to your face, right? YouTube comments, Instagram comments. Do you ever get people being sexist towards you or, you know, maybe not necessarily outright, but maybe they you sense a bit of disagreement? Or is it the flip side where people love it and they get behind you and they're like, yeah, it's so good to see, you know? just a different angle or different personality, you know? Yeah, I think, I think for the most part, it's, I've been pretty amazed actually at how positive the reception has been and how really nice people have been. And especially people in the industry that, you know, have big jobs and, and, and they're very important people and yet they'll give out the time to chat to you because, yeah, there's there's something a little bit different and they're and they're keen to listen. But I think it's like anything, I think as long as you can sort of prove yourself, then people give you the time of day. Um and that's yeah. the way that I sort of look at it. I don't even look at it through the lens of female or male. I think as long as you can prove your worth and I don't know, based on merit and ability. Um Yeah people people start to listen to you and yeah there's definitely those moments where people sort of look at you like you actually you you know what you're talking about a bit there <laughs> there's definitely those moments what are you <laughs> what kind of creature are you like a unicorn or something but yeah i have moments I have moments like that but no for the most part it's it's actually been really really positive well i wonder if people I, I, my guess is that they wouldn't be surprised about your knowledge because you're female. They'd probably be surprised about your knowledge because you're a sports teacher or you, you, you weren't somebody who necessarily did necessarily did the trade. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a whole interesting story in and of itself, isn't it? Right. Like, cause you were telling me before that you, you still do a little bit, but it sounds like YouTube and maybe parenting is, is what takes up the most of your time these days. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I, um, so I, my background is science and health teacher. Um, and then I right. took over the, the sport program at one of the local schools. And I quite like that because I got to deal with the ovals and the ground staff and stuff as well and work pretty closely with them. Um, yeah. But yeah, then we had our first daughter. And to be totally honest, I got bored on maternity leave. I didn't like every, everyone tells you, are oh, you going to lose sleep or you're going to do this when you, when you have a baby. But what they, I don't think anybody told me is how much downtime I would have just yeah. waiting while the baby, while the baby slept and then, you know, you feed it and then put it back. <laughs> I shouldn't call it it, but and then you're <laughs> waiting for it to, for the baby to go back to sleep. And yeah, this is, I, I hate wasting time. Like I'm very, have to be doing something all the time. So that's when I started um, the business Real Solutions, and yeah. I just thought, oh, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. And then fast forward, COVID came, and I was thinking, oh, this is probably not going to go well for the business, and it went the opposite, Crazy. Like the other way, completely, because people had time, and they were at home, and they had money because you could you can go out and spend money, and you know, go out for drinks and stuff with your be with your friends and things so they were at home wanting to look after their lawns and things and it yeah it went totally the other way and then people started rebuilding mowers and yeah it just went crazy i mean that's fascinating because yeah. i find that with yeah i i think one of the things that happened i talked about this in the last podcast which hasn't been released yet it'll probably come out straight after we finish recording this that i feel like the industry is as a whole 
it used to be looked down on quite a lot. And then there is still a pocket of people who see gardeners or people who work in the industry as, you know, like you sort of failed at school, you know, if you really want to be successful, be a lawyer or something like that. But if you look at the statistics on people who are happy in their jobs, right, they did this study, they didn't do it on gardening, but they did a study on like farming versus mm-hmm. office jobs and the farmers were so much more happy with their life they they were so they enjoyed themselves i think there's something about getting outside being outside working outside seeing um the fruit of your labor because you can't really do that with a spreadsheet and i like a lot of my work is is administrative and running a business and all this sort of stuff and you're doing that work it's you don't get the same satisfaction making a spreadsheet or doing your bass or whatever it is as you do mowing a lawn, turning around seeing those beautiful stripes or or maybe fertilizing a lawn coming back two weeks later and it's greener and there's there's this huge satisfaction you're working outside you're getting a lot of exercise there's so many things going on and i think that people have started to get clued into that whereas when i started my business 10 years ago it was seen as quite a lowly role i think it's becoming at least to some people, a lot more attractive. And maybe that's why there's maybe COVID kickstarted that a little bit as well when people got really sick of being stuck inside, you know, like they got really sick of it and they started to realize actually, no, some of these jobs, tradesmen, you know, not just gardening, farming, tradesmen, working outside, they're really appealing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for me personally too, it's a bit of a, being out on the lawn is a bit of a like a mental health thing without going too airy fairy or anything like that but it it is a it's a bit of a break and it's a time to sort of have your own space for yourself and like you said you you achieve something you can look back at what you've done there's progress i don't know there's something about being connected to nature in a way that yeah i for me it's it's a really nice thing for me to do and when I haven't been able to mow the lawn in a couple of weeks like I can tell and and it's sort of the way my personality is as well and and you just sort of you go you know what I'm gonna go out and mow the lawn and you feel better you can you can think about whatever's on your mind you solve some of the biggest issues that you have yeah. if you've got any while you're mowing or while you're edging or something it's yeah it's your time to sort of think uninterrupted get something done but at the at the same time you're getting that incidental exercise as well and so scientifically you're going to feel better after that yeah I mean, there's so many benefits to it it is funny like you can solve so many problems and that's why yeah. people listen to i i also think that not only like if you, if you do it as a as a hobby or in your home lawn right you don't do it 10 15 times a day Right, it is good just to stop and break and think about things. But when you're doing it all the time as well, there's this huge opportunity to grow through listening to podcasts, through audio books, through then thinking about how to plan and strategize things because your brain is so underutilized when you're just mowing. Now, if you're solving problems and, you know, it's a big overgrown job and you've got to look out for rocks or whatever, you know, you can have definitely times where you're quite, you know, uh, involved but if I'm just mowing an oval for example I'm just sitting and striping up an oval I've got an hour and 15 minutes where I'm completely clear I can listen to smash out a podcast and you'll find that those little things over a long period of time will compound if you listen to health podcasts if you're listening to you know self-improvement podcasts you know you actually become um, the gardening allows you to become a better person you know, you talk about not becoming airy fairy too much, but it's no, it's true. It's just practical. Like it's just so much. Yeah. There's so many benefits to getting out there and working with your hands, especially now. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And I I do the same thing. Like when I'm when I'm packing orders, I do I put a podcast on or something. Even if it's yeah. parenting or something, and you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm thinking. Oh, I wonder why my daughter's behaving that way. I wonder what this could mean. I wonder what that could mean. And I sort of yep. come at it from that from that sort of an angle, um, but yeah, it's it's certainly something that I think is a real opportunity. Do you know when I first started my business, all I really did was mowing lawns. Like I think a lot of people are just like that: mowing lawns, basic mulching stuff, things like that. That gets tiring 
pretty quickly. At least that was what my experience was. And, and the reality is that when I changed my model from being someone that just did lawn mowing to just did basic gardening services to somebody who could identify and solve issues and do product applications, two things happened. One, I made a lot more money per hour. Clients are much more willing to pay higher money for weed control, fungicide applications, fertilization, uh, all that sort of stuff. They see it as a more technical, rightly so, more technical and thus more valuable service. So way higher hourly rates when doing those services. The second thing that happened is it gave and it reinvigorated my passion for the industry because I went from somebody who was just doing lowly mowing jobs seen as a low life in society by some, others not, but yeah, you know how, well, you know what it's like if you're in business, to somebody who could solve people's problems, to somebody who could actually help them get a beautiful place to live. And I went back to really, really enjoying my job again. What's really cool is that we have a sponsor that literally sells every single product that I have used and use right now in my lawn care packages for my clients. And I'm honored to have them as a sponsor because the Lawn Shed, which is the sponsor, they're backed by and a partner business to uh, the Living Turf, or Living Turf, which is Australia's largest lawn product supplier. The thing about this, though, is that the Lawn Shed has a trade login and they have literally designed their website and their service around small businesses. I don't know of any other business that is literally dedicated solely to small businesses. And the thing that is really great is some of you might be listening to this going, I don't know how to do product applications. That's way too technical. They've got expert advice, people who are actually willing to answer your questions. And what you will find is you're going to learn very quickly going and buying a couple of bags of fertilizers, asking for some advice, applying it on your own own lawn, testing it out on some friends, seeing the results, getting the confidence from that, same with all the other products that they can sell. That's exactly what I did, honestly. Tried it on family, tried it on my own lawn, got experience with it, asked people to use it before, went out and used it, got those amazing results, and that was the start of me turning my business from something that was, yeah, making money, but not I didn't really love it, to something that was making great money, and I really did enjoy it. If you go on the lawn shed, and this sounds like something that's going to help your business, sign up to their trade account because there's some products that you won't see on the normal account. They only provide it to small businesses. Through the trade account, they will prioritize uh, you as a small business compared to other people or other you know, businesses out there. And if you go and sign up, say that you heard us from the Australian Lawn and Garden podcast, and that will support us as a podcast. I genuinely uh, am glad to have that as a partner because the reality is is that it's a true story close to my heart uh, and it is genuinely something I believe in, not just a cash grab like some other sponsorships might have been. So jump on them, the lawn shed, the trade section, jump there. Let's get back into the podcast. So that was quite funny, Amy, because you've just, um, we just had a little break there because you got a knock on the door from your neighbor, right? And uh, no word of a lie, they're asking you for lawn tips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually have. I, I'm filming up in the the barn, the shed shop, um, and so yeah, one of the neighbours has just pulled over. I thought something was really wrong. So I thought, oh, can I just go for a minute? Um, but no, he's just wanting some advice on on his lawn. So, do, has he driven up like the to the back of your property? Is that no, saying? no. So, so it's on. It's on the front. It's there's. A oh, okay. Sec- right. There's a sort of second driveway. Yeah. So it opens out to the street. So he's just seen the um, seen me sitting here with the doors up. He said, "I've driven by like twenty times. I've always wanted to stop and grab you, but you're here." But ah. I said, I'm just, just filming a podcast real quick. Sorry, I've got to go back. <laughs> That's right. Send send the uh, the link to this one, and we'll yeah, you know he'll, he gets a little he'll shout have a out there. I thought for a second he'd like properly driven up your driveway, like really intrusively, you know, right to the back of the no, yard where no, the no, barn no, is no. or something. <laughs> so you're in a shit now. Now I just told you this when in the gap, but I mean, how did I not know this? That you run real solutions. You just said that before, but I've only ever known you through like basically you just came up recommended on my YouTube, and I was like, oh, who's this? And and then looked at it, and then found you on Instagram. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, casually watch some of the videos every now and then. 
but you're running real solutions. So you're a cylinder mower lover. Uh, well, you know, clearly you have to be, if you've got to be selling that sort of stuff. They go ahead and, and uh, yeah, but that's, I mean, that I'm, I'm surprised. I'm going to learn a lot of stuff here. What's it like running a, a business that's selling parts and, you know, obviously things went through the roof in COVID. That's what you said before, but how's that been? Cause that's a massive change from, from teacher to, to small business owner or, you know, from a normal role, a normal job that most people have to running something that's sending things across the country. Like that's a, that's a massive shakeup of things, right? Yeah. Like, like I said before, I don't like being bored. I like, I like challenging things. I like things that keep me busy. Um, I think I was very naive when I got into a business. I did, I didn't really, I didn't, know, I, didn't have yep. goal. I didn't have goals. I didn't have anything like that. Like I just, it was almost a joke when, when I first started it. And um, it was my mum actually who came up with the name Real Solutions. I said, oh, what should I call it? Um, she said, oh, I want to go like a play on words like Real Solutions. I was like, I love that. Um, so, yeah, it's been a learning process. And it's for me at the moment, I think just efficiencies and stuff like that are where I'm trying to put a lot of my energy. Like, especially I can be a little bit of a control freak, um, as I think a lot of lawnies are and a bit of a perfectionist and yeah. um yeah so there, there's things about the business that i'm sort of learning i think some of the best advice i got recently actually was um you can't work on your business if you're too busy working yeah. in your business and i that's just stayed with me and that's definitely a snapshot of where i am now currently every like business is such a I love business because it's such a personally challenging and personally rewarding thing, right? And you sort of, especially when you're a small business owner, it's just you, right? Nobody, you can't blame anybody else if something goes wrong, right? You know, like, I mean, sometimes the economy happens or sometimes whatever. There are are circumstances, but 99% of the time, it's all on your shoulders. And people, some people hate that. Sounds like you're the sort of person who, who loves that, right? bit of both like like most things and interesting that i love in life i feel pretty conflicted about it like there's sometimes covid would have been a really good example of a lot of businesses did it so tough and here i was as a teacher with an essential job and a safe job really it's like so i could keep i could keep doing that i know what i'm going to get paid i know when i'm going to get paid you know, you, you put in more effort, you're not really going to get paid more. You're still going to get paid the same yep. amount. Um, whereas, yeah, it, it wasn't until I started a business. I've always respected business owners, but it wasn't until I started it that you see the the slog and, and the little decisions and how you do question and go, is this the right thing? Not just for me, for my family, you know, for the people yeah. who rely on you. And then I, I, I look at friends who have, employees and at least like i joke with my husband he's my lowest paid employee of all time (laughs) you know but you know as businesses go on you you feel responsible for the people that you employ as well and so the decisions that you make don't just impact just you for that day and, and just your customers there's yeah there's a lot more to it so it can be a lot of pressure and sometimes i really enjoy that challenge and then yeah other times it, it can get a little bit much, but I, I'm just learning and I quite enjoy learning. Sometimes they're hard lessons, but I think it's not failing unless it's, it's not failing if you can learn from something and you can't be scared of failure. And I think, yeah, I'm just at that age maybe, but I'm not scared to try. Not, yeah. not scared to sort of have a crack and if it fails it fails but it's not going to be the end of the world what's you know I, I love that that's that's the thing that gets me excited about business is is you you get rewarded you also have that challenge things can go wrong you know there's all that sort of stuff that happens um but another thing that happens is is those beautiful 
um, you get these great moments. Like, like, do you remember the first real, I mean, I'm sure you do the first real sale you had, maybe not from a family member or a friend or something. You know, it's just some person on the internet found you and actually bought something, you know, like, do you remember what that was? The first thing you sold? It was a hide of cut bar. <laughs> of course you remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge sale. Um, yeah, How it, much it did it cost? A, <laughs> I think I think I had them listed at the time for like fifteen dollars, and, and people would kind of go, "As if you'd pay, as if you'd pay fifteen dollars for that." I thought, man, I I just paid fifty dollars for mine. When I, when I couldn't find it. And that's where most of my products sort of came from is I got jealous of people in the U S having access to whatever lawn care equipment they wanted just down at, you know, their version of Bunnings. It's like, why don't we yes. have that? Why don't we have hand aerators? Why don't we have this? So yeah, that's sort of where it was born, but it was very much, um, I, I had, I had a free website. Remember big cartel. I don't know if that's still around. I uh, no, I don't. It was a totally uh, free e-commerce website, <laughs> so you didn't you didn't have to pay like your monthly fee because there's no way I was paying. I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think this business is going to do that great. Um, yeah, we'll just, if I, we'll if I sell two height of cut bars a year, I'm happy. You know, fifteen bucks every <laughs> now and then, I'll be laughing. <laughs> yeah, honestly though, honestly, it was like oh, I've got to buy got to buy steel in six meter length, so I'll just make what I need to make for me. And then just if I can sell, yeah. if I can sell off the rest of that six meter length, then we're good. Um, and yeah, very quickly that sort of changed. So, but yeah, the big cartel websites, I think it was, you could sell 10 items for free. And then it was, that was a huge <laughs> decision of the time. That was my huge business decision. Oh, Am I going to wow. pay for a website? <laughs> yeah. That's classic. Oh man, especially like, cause I mean, we're coming up to 10 years in business, man. The amount of money I've spent on my website, but it's so worth it as well. But like, yeah, I remember that mindset of trying to get everything like, well, what's the cheapest thing you can do? But then, then you change yeah. it one day. It's like, what's the best return on investment? But when you first start and you've got no money, it's like 50 bucks it, here exactly. and there. And people go, why don't you do this? Yeah. Yeah. People give you give you feedback and they go, why don't you do this? Oh, that costs money. You need to have that first. Or, yeah. Um, yeah, Some sometimes people think you're a bigger company than you are. It's like, it's just me. I can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, um, yeah. I remember, I mean, I worked very, very, for a very brief period of time for a business that did a lot of shipping by sales. They're actually selling plastic bin bags it was their entire business model and when i was like 18 i was in the warehouse and i would i would ship things here there and everywhere and uh like i was a guy who put all the boxes on and they did like honestly they were doing maybe a ton of or like 500 kilos to a ton of bin bags sent around the country every day you know yeah. <laughs> like it was crazy and they would do like oh you know i still go to these um I go to like restaurants and see in their bin. It's like, oh, that's the business I used to work for and stuff. Anyways, uh, here's something that, you know, I think you might bring up some embarrassing moments for you, but I'll throw myself under the bus. I basically had to quit that job after a while because I got bored of all the different packing. So it just wasn't in my uh, makeup to keep doing this job. I kept sending things to the wrong spot in the country. And specifically, I was the wrong type of plastic bag because they, they were all codes. So I was like, I don't remember what it was, but certain bag code LH251. And I'll get LH253 or whatever it is, you know, and it's just a completely different size or like completely the wrong thing. And um, it probably happened four or five times in maybe, I don't know, a month or something like that. And they never had it before. I just couldn't do it. And it was so embarrassing every single time because, you know, you you know what, you know what, you can't point the finger at. Have you ever had a moment like that where you just really stuffed something up? You were overtired, the kids weren't sleeping, you've picked up the wrong thing, sent something to somebody, and you're just like, oh my goodness, what have I done here? Yeah, especially especially early days when I was, I was working like two, I was working full time. And then I'd come home and, and package things after the kids were asleep. Exactly as you said. Um, yeah, I've done the old switcheroo. Sent one. Oh, so you said, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then it was, 
I don't, I don't know. Don't know how it happened, but it was, yeah, getting the email back. I really liked them. And it was funny because um, the customer wanted the roller that I sent. They said, oh, no, I like this grooved one. I want to keep that. Um, can, yeah, I, I'd prefer to keep this one. I said, oh, I'm really sorry you got the wrong order. I'll, I'll arrange for a courier to collect and we'll swap it over. And he's like, no, 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 I want this one now. Can I have this one? Okay. So, yeah, I've sent a different one out. But, um, so, yeah, it sort of worked out for the, for the best anyways. But, yeah, I'm good for a mistake. And I'm certainly on whether it's in business or on YouTube or on the social groups. Um, I'll get things wrong every now and then. I think we all do. I don't think, don't no, think yeah. anyone's perfect. Um, but yeah, certainly, certainly good for a mistake here or there. Uh, yeah, I it, I'm bringing up all these memories of this place I worked at for about four months. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about <laughs> shipping things out, trauma. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Oh man, I hated that job. I mean, like the people there were nice, but. Um, it's just very boring. It was like sitting around waiting for somebody to send me like, go grab this box and put it over there. It was like my whole, oh, yeah, that's why it didn't last very long. It was literally like straight out of school. So whatever. But um, the thing about uh, like the, those businesses, they're just very, but that style of business is quite impersonal. You know what I mean? Like you just feel like you're fulfilling orders. It sounds like though that you still got this sort of, because you kept it small and you're such a little niche, you know, it's not like plastic bags where everyone uses them. Do you still feel like real connection with the people that you're, you're working with? Or is it often the case where it's just like, well, someone randomly has gone on the internet. They've got no idea who I am. You know, like, do you, like how do you feel about that? Do you create a bunch of relationships and people come back and they just love you who, who, who you are, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one of my first, customers and I dealt with him a couple of times was Andrew from Egan's Greens on Instagram. Yep. Um and he was he was one of the first customers. I, I think before I even registered Real Solutions as a business, I used to just make those those rollers. Um and he'd he'd come in and collect a few. And yeah. I would consider the ATO's I was watching this, you're gonna get in trouble for that now. So I was for saying what? you've just you just admit admitting to doing business without a business name. What are you <laughs> Yeah, I had a Gumtree listing. I was, oh, that, was, that was back when Gumtree was, was cool. So <laughs> there's probably no record that of thing. that now. Yeah, you, yeah, you're fine. You know, don't worry. They're not going to sue you for a billion dollars. <laughs> anyway, so Egan's Greens, he, you say you were considering a friend and he's uh, he was your first or one of the first people? He, he was one of the first customers, yeah, and he's always supported. I, there'd be times where I, I'll say to him, I'll be like, you don't even need this. Like, this is not something that you're probably going to use. You just, he's just supporting you. And that's, that's what you do though. You make, you make positive relationships and you support each other. And that's what I'm loving about YouTube is I'm, the more people I work with, you, you don't sort of just leave them after that. Like we've sort of kept in touch and, and you communicate yep. pretty regularly and, and that become, you know, they become your people. Yeah. What's we talk about some mistakes of sending things there though? Like, like, let's let's move away from the bad side of it. Have you? I'm sure there's times. It's probably one or two moments that stick in your mind where someone's made an order so massive that you've yeah maybe it was early days and it was something that today would be normal, but you remember that first big order you get, or maybe there's just somebody who just ordered such a large number of things. You're like, what the heck? Like, where does this come from? This isn't a single fifteen dollar hype bar, like. Uh, do you have stories like that? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say the first time that Lawn Solutions Australia approached me, um, they sell my aerator and I didn't even, it didn't even register. I was just filling an order. I think the backstory is one of their staff members ordered um, my yep. core aerator. And I think they featured it in a video and I didn't get tagged in it till till a while after. Um, but they they got in contact and they're like, hey, we'd actually really like to sell your aerator There's, and, and sort of went into, they've, they've tried a couple and I was sort of, I was just chuffed that they, yep, you know, yep. tried mine and and that sort of didn't come from knowing people or anything. It's the tool did the talking. So, yeah, that was, that was really exciting. So, 
that that's probably the one. Right. And how many items did they, I mean, I don't want to get into too many numbers if you don't want to get into it, but like, I mean, I'm surely people would only buy one at a time. So how many were they buying at a time or like, you know, what's that? Was it like, did you even have enough stock? <laughs> you know, like, were they coming and going, no. we, need, we need 30 of these or whatever it was. And you've got like six in the shed or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think, I think I, the last time I did it, they, we sent about 60, but um, oh. no, I didn't, I didn't have enough stock at the time. And it, <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, can I fill with this amount? And, and they've been really great to, to deal with, but now I, I try to keep their stock sort of on hand so i can fill it pretty quickly um freight's the big killer with those because they're not it is they're not a lot they're not a light item and i'm sure you've also had moments where uh well have you ever had a moment where you feel like some someone was lying to you where you had sent something and like oh it didn't come or whatever and you know you can sort of see on the shipping tracking or something like that the re- the reason why I bring this up is I have I don't know if you know um Catch Pro, you know yeah. they um yeah so the guys at Catch Pro they've got these uh, things called equipment defender racks and we use them in our business and um, I bought one from them and it never rocked up to my house and Ben and I were trying to get to the bottom of it and it was I don't know if it was stolen like it was delivered and stolen or if it just got lost or if it was stolen at the depot or what happened. And it, it took a while. Luckily we were buying it preemptively. So we didn't need it, need it immediately. And eventually Ben just sent us a second one, you know, and it was just, I mean, he had to wear it. It was a shame. And he was telling me that the insurance on the deliveries is so expensive to get insurance that you may as well just wear it every now and then. And I was like, man, yeah. People are dishonest. People lie. You know, we get that in business all the time. And it's like, I wonder how many times that's happened where you sort of you sort of know, but you can just never put the finger on it. You, know, you, can, you can't quite get them and it just costs you, you know? I've, I've been lucky because I haven't, I haven't dealt with that. Or if people have, I certainly haven't found out. Or, or pulling the wool over your eyes. Law <laughs> Solutions has actually been getting 70 of them instead of 60 yeah. every time. They come, they just never let you know. Yeah. No, no, that'd be good. <laughs> no, no. I think um, probably more so the, the freight side of things is unfortunately there's some, it's really hard when you're sending Australia wide because a, a career company that's excellent here locally can really drop the ball if you send something interstate and i've found that massively Mm. so to the point where i almost took away like the automated side of shipping on the website because there were certain carriers that i didn't want to use in certain states because it just ended up being more of a headache for me than it was worth so Mm -hmm. that that would be the only side that's been frustrating and yeah the the lost orders yeah it happens every now and then and you just sometimes the insurance is even hard to sort of to sort of even get that back but i just think yeah. it's all part of part of business and you sort of have to incorporate those types of costs and things like that as you sort of go along yeah what's the product that you sell on your on your website i mean you have some ones that are really popular and then you have some that you feel like this should get more sales Right, like this is a really good thing that no one's getting, you know, where it's just a really niche product. So there's just not going to be a lot of people interested. But what's the most underrated thing that you sell? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I'm having, I'm, I'm having not, a look. There's, there's shelves over there. I'm just having a look. Going, which one? I'm looking on it now as well. <clears throat> um, I, I really don't know. There's definitely been things in business that I've like items that I've got and put up that I did not think would be as popular as they are. And then, yeah, there's others that you think will be really popular based on the socials and then they're actually, they don't do that well. Um, what, what's you know, a, what surprised you the most? What's the thing that's the most popular that really surprised you? The aerators. Right. For sure. Yeah, and that that was just I, I couldn't find anything. Like I tried the 
the ones at Bunnings. I think they were all like top eject, but the tines aren't very long. And oh, then, yeah. Yeah, I just got oh, jealous of the people in the US. And I thought, well, if I were to design one and, yeah, and that's designed it and put it all together and made a couple of revisions, I think we're at version three now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, definitely the aerator, but, but I think because like you said before, it's a very niche market, whereas an aerator, most people have a lawn. So it sort of makes sense that, you know, your population size is, is going to be a lot larger when you're talking about aerators compared to Scott Bonner parts. Yeah. 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 Air aerator is useful for anybody, no matter what, what mower they're using it for. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard slog though. I mean, I'm used to. Because we've got the the you know cam driven uh, Billy Goat aerator for the business, hey. it's like I can imagine I couldn't imagine doing a massive area with something like that. But on the flip side, a lot of people have very small blocks now, and so there's heaps of people out there who have twenty or thirty square meters of lawn, and to hire one of those machines or to pay a professional to to do that. It's you know you may as well buy it and then you've got it and you know the the one time that you buy it's probably paid off roughly what the professional would have cost anyway so that's probably yeah, where marketing yeah. is my guessing yeah exactly and even like I I have that Billy Goat plugger as well and sometimes if you got I don't know irrigation or areas that are hard to get to there's always those yes. little patches that you don't quite get the the times into and that's where you you pull out their hand aerator but. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's it's like you know those people that don't work out for however long, and then and then you go, oh, I'm gonna go to the gym, and you you do everything to the point where you can't then move the next day. And I think people, some people, unfortunately, <laughs> fall into that trap yeah. with the hand aerators, and they they aerate their entire I don't know 200 square meters or whatever, and then hate themselves the next day. <laughs> they do, yeah. <laughs> I can also yeah. imagine that. Somebody who eats as much KFC as me is probably going to have a better, <laughs> better effectiveness than somebody who's who's as fit and healthy as you are. <laughs> you know, there's just there's a there's a spectrum. Of, it's almost as if like the person, the least, the less healthy you are, or the more the more overweight. To you know, to be frank about it, you are. The um, it's almost like it's the one area where maybe that actually makes the the exercise easier. <laughs> like it goes into the ground a little easier. <laughs> Just throwing myself yeah, on the I, bus uh, there. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, a bit, of, a bit of that type of humor never goes astray. Um, no, I think I, I also, like we, we made that and with more weight because I couldn't get the aerators to go into the ground. That's the other side of it. And I guess that's one of the things that I've come up with for being female. We, we usually weigh less than our male counterparts. And so I can't get, pluggers and aerators and things like that into the ground so that's why and one of the reasons why but that's why that um the bottom of the aerator is um solid steel is because yeah. I, I didn't have the weight so i added that weight there um but yeah it's a it's a bit of a workout i i still break it into i always tell customers when they come here i just say 50 square meters at a time just Otherwise, you'll look at it with such disdain. You never want to touch that aerator again. So that's the key. Yeah. You know, I do hear it every now and then where people will say things like, man, I love podcasts. I hate the ads, right? Can you give me five seconds to try and change your mind on this for a second? The reality is if you love the podcast, love the ads, listen to the ads and support the ads, whether it's me or anybody else. And the reason is the reality of this model of business is that the podcast does not survive without the ads. If you love what we're doing at the podcast, here are two things you can do to support us. One, jump on the lawn shed. We talked about them before. You're probably busy mowing a lawn, cutting some hedges, you know, driving, something like that. Jump on the lawn shed, make a trade account. Just check out the products that they have. Say you found us through the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. You don't even have to buy anything right now. When you do need something, jump on there and that will support us. The second thing is our Patreon account. If you're not somebody who wants to buy products um, or you want to support in an even you know a more direct way, jump on Patreon. You can support us through two things. One, very topical. You can buy me a, a Pepsi Max every month or you can buy me a Zinger Box every month. Full disclaimer, I don't actually 
spend that money on those specific things is actually more likely to go to things like the costs of actually running the podcast. But it's just a fun, lighthearted way of going about it. So honestly, if you want to have the podcast keep going, there's a huge amount of time that goes into this. If you have learned anything that is worth $5, jump on Patreon, you know, support us to that amount. If we haven't done anything of any value, then don't support us because we don't deserve it. But I hope we have done something. Jump in there, support us, help us to keep going. It's a lot of work, uh, and I'm sure you can understand. Anyways, let's get back into the podcast. Let's go back to your YouTube side of of what you do because that's a, such an interesting – very few people go down the path of YouTube. Very few people go down the path of, of, of being a content creator, whatever that means, you know. Um, and it's this very – if anybody who's done it or who's th- thought about doing it, it's a really interesting world because you you work so hard doing something that may have zero benefit. Like you, know, you can put a video out there and no one really watches it and you put all this yeah. time into it and you can put something else out there that you don't put all that much time into it and it just, just goes. Like I remember on Instagram, I, I've um, not that I, I have spoke uh, focused too much on Instagram over the years, but I remember I put up a a video of a camellia that's at my house that was in full flower, and it randomly was very popular in India. Like I got like two hundred or something like that likes on this video. I've only got like a couple of hundred followers on my page, but I had like two hundred likes on this video. And it was like 180 of them were like Indians. <laughs> it's like you just scroll down. I don't like you got no idea why. And it's a very it can be very frustrating and and, and difficult and and you feel like you want to quit sometimes. And so how have you found going from a more normal traditional style of, of business to YouTube? Is it just a labor of love or is are you trying to grow that into something that is sustainable? Yeah. No, it I a bit of both, to be perfectly honest. I think um, part of it is because I've had to take a little bit of a step back from teaching. I, I genuinely miss it. It's a job that I love. I don't think there's right. any teachers out there who are teaching unless they genuinely love it. Um, so I, part of it's just to continue the education and, and something that I'm learning from, obviously, when you're editing a video, I'll go back and watch it. And just the other night I said to my husband, I said, my gosh, I need to go back to lesson planning. Like I need to go back right. to, to teacher, graduate teacher 101 be, because I know the content and I know what I'm talking about. But unless you have those sort of cues to follow, which is exactly like a lesson plan, um, yeah, you sort of, and especially my personality type, I'll just go off on tangents all the time. And then it just creates for so much extra work for me in the editing and there's so much footage that just doesn't get used. And then I'm talking to myself and yeah. So I I think it's certainly a labor of love and I've seen there's a lot of people out there on the socials who are absolute brainiacs and just have so much information. But I think, they're so smart that unfortunately when they speak, they leave, they lose the average Aussie because they're like, what are they talking about? Cause, cause they can't sort of follow it. It's, we're making things too complex sometimes. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I thought I'll, I'll give it a crack. It might, might be useful, um, you know, as a teacher. And I think as a, I'm, I admin a couple of Facebook groups and you see the frequently asked questions. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could sort of answer those in a meaningful way backed with some actual evidence and then go, here you go. Here's your answer to that rather than, you know, which is, and it's really great to see peer to peer advice, but sometimes like you, you've seen on the socials, yes. people answer and everyone's got a different answer. And that must be really overwhelming to anyone out there who's just starting and we've all been at that point sometime like anyone who is an expert in anything has been a beginner at some point yeah. so I, it- yeah that that's sort of where it's come from i do have i do have some other sort of ambitions with 
with the YouTube channel and, and just working with people. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's got to be, I think your heart's got to be all in it, especially, um, I know myself very well and I know, I know how I work. And like, like I said, if I get bored, then it's not a good thing. So I, I know what I like and I know what I want to do. And I want to go down this route of scientific trials and it might not get the views and that's okay, but it's something there for people to refer back to. Well, I also think that with the internet, it's opened up, like back, I've talked about this a few times, there used to be the right way to do things from a television standpoint because you wanted to entertain the most people possible because there's only five or six channels. And so you needed something that was a bit more of a broad interest. And so niche you know, interests never got the light of day. And so that was seen as something that just wasn't going to attract enough people. But then what happened is the internet has started to change that. And you find that people, they go, what, what used to be the case is you would have TV stars, you know, movie stars, you know, people you would look up to and admire. And I think now the internet's changed it that you have people, there's still those people that you admire and stuff. But I think a lot of people watch content not from a sense of, oh, this person is a star, they're a hero, but more like they're a friend. They're an online friend. You know, there's somebody yeah. that you feel like, especially the type of content that you make and, and Brenton and Ben and, and Nick, you know, those, those other lawn Australian people who are, who are doing YouTube. It's like come along for a journey with somebody who you feel like you're, you're getting to know, you know, like when I, uh, when I met Ben in person for the first time, it was like, it wasn't, I didn't feel now he was, we talked on the phone a few times before that, but it was like, I felt like I'd already been at his house, you know, <laughs> I've been there every Saturday for the last however yeah. many years, you know, and it, there's something about it where um, you don't need the best content to you know be the mr beast style of youtube where it's just engaging and amazing 100 million views there's a whole section of people they just want to hang out with somebody who yeah they just want to watch them and you know it's they're, they're interested in you as a person more than they are in the necessarily how good your videos are and obviously the better the video is the more people come along for the ride it's it's not like you can create rubbish and get a lot of followers but i think that yeah, like what you're doing, if it's interesting a few people, it's like they'll jump along for the ride, you know? Yeah, it's there's certainly like that sense of community, especially in the in in lawn care in Australia. There there really is that sense of community, and it it blows my mind that you can walk past people in Woolies and like you would know their name, you can recognize their name on a forum or or something like that but you could be walking past one another in Woolies and you'd never even know no but no yet idea. you'd have yeah. you'd have like you know you'd have banter and chats and stuff like that you know the people that you like each other's posts and you like each other's comments you wouldn't know them from a bar of soap but youtube sort of takes that away and you do sort of get to know people and you do like anybody who watches the channel would be i can be a little bit quirky sometimes um and or i can do things a little bit differently and that's that's just sort of me so they do get a bit of that personality and there is that like sometimes i'll get people who who comment and they'll they'll have a joke with me in the comments or it's really really nice when people say oh hey how's um how's this project going in the background yep and to me yep. that shows wow they've actually watched from the beginning or gone back and watched so they know, and they're like, "When are you going to get? When are you going to get to the pool project? And <laughs> have you have you thought about how you're going to get rid of the carpet grass out the back that I hate? Um, yeah, <laughs> and and things like that. So yeah, it's it's a really nice sense of community that I, I don't know. I, I sort of wasn't sort of expecting, but it's been really nice. And yeah, you meet people, and people will turn up here. Um, the funny one, like you said before, and you didn't know that. I had real solutions. I've had people turn up to drop their mower off or get fertilizer or something. And they go, I recognize this lawn or I recognize this house. <laughs> and so they've watched the channel and, and sort of had no clue. And I don't know, it's really, it's really nice to think that people would actually give up their time on a weekend too and, and watch it. Because I know that 
that's that's what we do and even even my kids like um my daughter Haley would sometimes come in she goes are you going to watch a lawn tip vid and like it becomes <laughs> part of, it becomes part of your routine and it becomes part of your part of your family and i think that's what's it's really it's a really nice feeling when when people will actually give up their time to watch you yeah and and that that support because you don't need that many people to have a viable small business. Like if you've got to employ people, you do, right? But like what you hear it that people are a lot are really supportive and there's things like Patreon. You know, it's like for us as a podcast, Patreon, you know, supporting the sponsor that we have, the lawn shed, things like that, using the links. People want to get involved in that because it's like five bucks a month to, to you know, get involved in the Patreon. And if a hundred people do that, right, that's 500 bucks a month, you know, and it's mm. not like you're setting the world on fire or anything like that, but $5 a month, you would never notice that. You, you, you know, that's not the difference between someone going bankrupt and someone, you know, being able to feed their family yeah. or whatever. But um, because the community is very supportive, they will, they will jump on, they will support you. Like, and, and that's, that's what makes this whole little niche of the the world of, of you know content creators and that's what makes them tick and that's what makes them move forward and it's 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 a cool way of doing business because it's sort of i don't know it's just there's so it's almost like you're so committed in a friendship way uh and you really love the person that the five dollars is just nothing it's just yeah. you know so you're supporting them but it's almost free you know, it's just like it is. It's like it's more. It's way closer to a friendship than it is to a to a movie star. Sort of, I'm you know compared to the viewer who is the pleb of society. You know, I, I just love that. I don't even watch. I don't watch TV shows. I don't watch movies. I don't care anymore. I just watch YouTube. You know, like in sport. You know, I love yeah. a lot of sport. But yeah, I wonder. I wonder where it'll be in ten years. Like, yeah, because people seem to care less and less about how professional it is, and just more and more about. Yeah, how interesting it is, I guess. Yeah, I think um, it, it's like anything. It's You think of some of your closest friends and how many hours do you spend with them per week? And some of them can be your absolute closest friends and you probably still struggle to see them, you know, one hour oh, a week. Easy. And yet, yeah. <laughs> and yet we'd, we'd um, you know, we're, we're seeing people on YouTube like, yeah, I, I think it's funny that, you know, my kids will recognise Ben or Brenton and they, <laughs> yeah. they just know what's going on, just like I'll recognize Coco Melon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lucky me. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think it's you do sort of get to know because you can't be fake because people will pick it out really quickly. Mm. And and it, and it would be too I don't know too glossy or something. And and I think that's what's really likable about YouTube is no one's really got that super glossy like. Ben's perfected it over time, but everyone's got those really humble beginnings and, you know, I'm just out here having a go and people can get behind that. People can get behind it when people are just putting themselves out there and having a go. You'd rather um, support someone than, than tear them down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a moment, like I know for me with this podcast that there's, like there was this time, <clears throat> people are going to be annoyed that I haven't uploaded this, but I sometimes do solo episodes. Usually I'm talking about business, right? And solo episodes are so much harder to make because it's it's like a lecture in a sense. You actually have to prepare for it. You have to have notes. You can't just talk. You know, I've got notes here about where I wanted to go with the conversation, but it's so much more natural to talk. Anyway, I made this podcast on how to price a lawn mowing round you know because there's a lot of bad information out there i've recorded that like two and a half times and i just keep cancelling it because i'm like it's just too it's too heady it's too boring it's not engaging enough i sort of know i'm gonna lose so many people on this because it's so hard to explain <clears throat> most people listen only so hard to explain in audio form only and you just oh you know you just give up on it Maybe one day I will do it because I think it's an important subject, but it's just such a hard thing to do. Has there been any videos that you've done where you've basically recorded the whole thing, you've got it all done, and you just can't upload it because you just know it's not quite the standard or you got halfway through recording and just gave up on it? 
Have you ever had those moments as well? Um, the the spraying the cooch mite one was I was umming and ahhing about that because I did that over I think two visits to a friend's place, and I was just umming and ahhing about it more so because I know how there's such a divide on people's way of thinking about whether you should use chemicals like that and whether you should encourage the use of chemicals and and I absolutely understand the contractors side of things um so for anyone listening who doesn't know like you, you've got to you've got to have your spray license you've got to have carry sds of all this stuff um you've got to carry spray logs and got to wear all the ppe obviously potentially notify people and yet someone who's got no clue who has posted a photo up on facebook and people said that's pitch might get onto it get onto it can jump online and two days later they have that same product and can go out and follow the label maybe not follow the label i don't know yeah. so I, I was i was really concerned about posting that because i didn't want people to think i was encouraging um the use of, of so pesticides like that yes yeah Is that yeah. So that? I, yeah yeah i'm very mindful of I, I'm not a big believer in throw everything in the kitchen sink at your lawn, um, especially when it comes to those sort of chemicals. Um, but obviously there's a time and place for it. And so I just thought, you know what, well, instead I will educate about it and I'll say, you know, what you need to be careful of and, and how to use it properly because you go out there and because people are so scared, no, there's not really much information out there on how to actually mm. do it and how to do it safely. Um, so, so that's, I guess, the risk that you're running. And so here I was all anxious and nervous about uploading that and there's seemingly been no, I don't know, unless I've been kicked out of some groups and people, <laughs> people are totally going, oh my gosh, did you see that? Um, but no, that, that was received really well. Actually, um, Indigo, specialty products uh, contacted me about it and said oh thank you for featuring malice duo in the video so yeah it's probably more so the things that i will uh, like self-doubt more than anything the things that i will hold back on like that very first video i i yeah it was only, it was such a leap because i'm already a pretty awkward human being as it is and then pop a camera in front of me and it's hilarious looking back at it because i'm literally <laughs> sitting sitting down on the ground like making myself really small and just talking i couldn't even make eye contact with the camera um yeah and yeah i just i didn't know what i was doing editing i've got more of a clue now but i'm still learning but well, you've been doing it for then, about a year now haven't you yeah yeah but back then it was just it took me so long to edit that video and it's so <laughs> cringeworthy um, <laughs> oh, and I, I almost didn't put it out and then i i think i think it was a friend actually that just said emma like a band-aid when have you ever really bothered <laughs> yeah, gotta... about what people think and i thought yeah that's fair and I'm, I mean, yeah i put it out there and you know it's behind us now don't look back when i'm done it <laughs> No, is it still is it still on your YouTube? Can we go watch it? <laughs> Drive all the yeah. traffic. Everyone goes to that first video just to embarrass yeah. you. Yeah, there'd be there'd be about five views total on that. I oh, will make it six at least. <laughs> After this. Well, you know, that's probably the thing you're most embarrassed by. What's the video that you're most proud of? The one that you think, uh, you know what, you know, obviously every time you can do better, but that's one that you you feel like, oh, I've done pretty well on that. Like I'm pretty happy with how that turned out, you know? Um, I think it would be the Lawn Reno series I, in for a number of reasons. I think um, before we started recording, we were talking about how Lawn Reno videos seem to be, yeah. the thing for people to watch and you you get good views so they're probably my top ranking videos in that sense but probably more so in terms of um a real sense of achievement because our last yeah. our last property was I think it's about 200 square meters and we'd put aussie blue down so it's just sort of maintenance whereas this place is just 
yeah. the soil's horrific and just that front area that I did was 500 square meters and I made a point of not letting my husband help me because he, <laughs> he kept he kept sort of coming out to help me and I said no no, no I've got to I've got to film it I, it's so important to me that everything that I do on the channel is realistic and right. people can people can watch it and go I can do that on my own lawn and then yeah. my husband even went as far as to say well just just like time lapse it or just turn the camera off and then turn it back on, you know, when you, when we're done. And I just, I have a tendency to be a little bit stubborn sometimes. So I just, you need, you know, to, you need to struggle on camera. Yeah. You send him back. That hard work. Honestly, that was, that was so challenging. I still have, I have photos of, I use the scarifier with um, tungsten tip tines and it was yep. just, it's a, it's a commercial one too. Like it's a Ryan, it's a good scarifier mm -hmm. and uh, it's got the, what's it called? The plate on the back to like stop the rocks. There's yeah. nothing stopping the rocks that are in this lawn out front. And to the point where I was walking to the side of it and I, I got a bit nervous about like putting the footage in there cause it's hilarious. Cause I'm jumping around, it's hitting me in the shins <laughs> as oh, I'm shit. scarifying. Yeah, it was, I had the biggest bruises and that was, I don't shy away from hard work, but that, that renovation was just huge. That was, that really took it out of me. <laughs> I do find in a professional sense that uh, some people, because, because, oh, you've lost your headphones. I just, lo I just lost my AirPod. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can hear me in the other ear while you're, while you're getting the, the back up again. The, um, professionally a lot of people will uh they'll do one or two renos and they'll find that because it's hard work you can charge a lot of money for it like you can charge a really good hourly rate because if someone's going to go out and do it themselves and they don't have a trailer they don't have a verti more they don't have an aerator they don't have it's actually a lot of money for them to do it themselves mm -hmm. so if it's going to cost them six hundred dollars to do it themselves and the entire weekend you know may as well pay somebody else a thousand dollars to just sort it all out for me and probably do a better job you know and so there's a lot of work, well, especially in WA. Um, I don't know what it's like at the rest of the country, but there's a lot of work in that. But it's so physical and people get sucked in because they're like, oh, we'll earn good money. And it's like, man, <laughs> this is tough. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you limit yourself to it. And maybe it's because on the internet, people sort of time lapse everything. They don't maybe yeah. show you how hard it is that like everyone gets sucked into it. And they spend all this money on this expensive equipment and then they go, man, what have I got myself into doing this every single day for, you know, a week? Oh, yeah, exactly. Like you can, it absolutely you can get some really good equipment out there that's going to that's gonna save you, but you're still going to have to do the hard work. The and, hard work. And, yeah, it was, it was really taxing. Actually, the thing that probably saved me was my camera battery dying because it forced me it forced me to take a break and then um that's probably one of the things that's so helpful about youtube and, so, and part of the reason i'm so drawn to it is it's so positive because i was messaging ben sims like as if he's going to give me the time of day and, and with a camera issue i said ben my my camera just keeps switching off it's saying it's overheating like it was lasting yep. 30 minutes and it was just pure coincidence that he had a sony and he said oh no you've got to change this setting but but also it was i don't have spare batteries so the battery right. would go dead i'd have to check the camera and then be like i'll charge the batteries and i would take a break and ice the legs or something but <laughs> yeah it was it that one would be the i'm proud of it for a number of reasons but yeah that was hard work and i can honestly say i did that whole front lawn on my own apart from well you probably <laughs> see i even probably... had help with the box out with the top dress and still i'm complaining <laughs> that's tough it's tough work i mean uh you probably could have gone to uh, your local sportswear shop and got some you know, some shin pads or something like that <laughs> some chivos to protect you <laughs> Maybe I'm, like I'm, four or five layers I'm of, even, of. I'm not even kidding. I'm doing it this year. I'm, yeah, I'll <laughs> Are make, you? I'll make a feature of it. Yeah, I'm. I'm not joking. Like the the shale rocks. It hurts so <laughs> go much. On, <laughs> go in a marketplace and see if you can find some like really old cricket pads. Maybe that <laughs> might be. <laughs> yes. 
And, uh, oh, someone's actually, got like that's a good idea. That could, be, that could make for a funny. That could make for a funny. <laughs> it video. would be. You have some sweaty <laughs> shins, but at least they're like not cut and bruised up and everything, you know. Oh man, it is. Yeah, I mean, we've used. I know the style of of of, of uh, Verdi that you're using. We use the the Mo Masters, or well, the Verdi uh, Groomer specifically, and they throw forwards, so you don't yes. have that that problem so much. But I mean, there's 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 goods and bads for everything as, as it goes with that. Um, I was thinking as well, like, well, there's, let's go. This the two two things that came to mind. You're talking about the bobcat, and I've just watched that video uh, that you've done. I think you released it a few days ago with the Ventrac that you were using. That's uh, quite yeah. recent, isn't it? Yes. So a Ventrac, I I've always been interested by those machines. Um, Pete from I think GCI Turf over in the US. I don't know if you ever watched him. Yeah, how good. Yeah, he's great. He's a great character. I love his accent. I watched his video fifty percent for just his accent and his attitude and his his mind. He's such a positive guy. And he's got a vent track and he has a lot of attachments for it. I think oh, it's just so cool. And uh, being from WA and loving cylinder mowers, they have a cylinder mower attachment. So I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. that's interesting. Anyway, so you're using a vent track on the weekend or whenever it was that you were doing this job, and uh, I was wondering about it. It's like. Because that what that's not yours. They've lent you no, something to use. How nervous do you get using? I don't know what that machine costs. Like with the attachments, you know, at least fifty grand plus, right? I don't. Did they tell you how much these things cost before? Or they just <laughs> they just leave no. it what? But no, it's tens I, I and think, tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah, but they're so you, they're absolute rigs. But I I didn't actually get to drive. I said no. They offered. They oh, offered okay, me. right. Yeah, I didn't actually no. I didn't trust myself. I'm sort of yeah. That because that's I would that's what I'm getting nervous wide about. Open spaces, yes. Yes. No, it was because it was up against fence lines and and it was fencing that we've just sort of paid for and just put in. So, you know, I'd rather be able to blame someone else if if something comes down or or anything goes wrong. Yeah. But no, I, I get real nervous about other people's property. Obviously, you, you respect other people's property, but I was just mesmerized when they when they came around and, and used it just like I am watching like Pete's videos or Ryan Nor's got he uses one at his new place. And yeah, they're just they're just amazing to watch. And I only got to see two attachments, but yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I feel like they're this is it's like the those sorts of machines are the crack cocaine of the lawn kit industry where <laughs> it's like you start with one attachment and then you know you have to keep going back down the rabbit hole and then yeah. you end up with yeah. An insane amount of money invested, and they've got you. You know, they got hooked for life. But, yeah, uh, you, I mean, collect, you collect attachments like they're Pokemon. You got to catch them all. Exactly. You, you don't even need it, but you got to, you know. Yeah. And then you go and convince your spouse. You know, this thing it only costs sixteen thousand dollars. You know, like if I was to buy the whole machine, it would be twenty five. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. But it reminds me of like, um, uh, I, I many years ago, I bought a a zero turn ride on lawnmower and I had never driven a zero turn ride on lawnmower and here I am buying one and um you know how blokes are I don't know if you're the same but um some ladies are but most blokes are like this where it's like you know we're not going to ask for help to, to, uh, I've just bought this machine you know so nobody needs to show me the manual on how to use it so I've got to drive it up a ramp into a trailer you know and <laughs> drive it out of the shop and go up the ramp and I almost I come like a centimeter away from losing control (laughs) and driving it straight off my ramp literally a minute maybe even less than a minute after buying this bit of equipment and I was like I should have practiced on like a large open area first rather than trying to narrowly drive it up this small thing and it's like oh it's funny those things happen you know that's yeah, that's life. Yeah, that's the quickest right. way to learn is when the when the stakes are high. Yeah, exactly. And everyone at the shops watching you, and you know, you can have a <laughs> funny, embarrassing moment. Um, but the other thing I was going to, the other angle I was going to go about with the YouTube thing is uh, what I found is there's a huge difference 
you know, if you go to learn something, you try and learn something just for yourself. You, 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 you get enough understanding of it. That's pretty good. But when you try and learn something to teach somebody else, you really, I've found at least, maybe you find this as well, in that you really learn it. Like there's something about having to present something or having to teach something that forces you to deep dive a lot more. And it's quite interesting in that that's a side benefit of doing this type of thing. I found it as a side benefit of hiring employees because over many years I've had to explain you know, why we do certain services, how to identify issues. And it's like, you just know it on a deeper level than you did beforehand. Have you found that with yourself? And then secondly, what are the sort, what are the biggest things you've learned that you weren't expecting to learn? Like things that you've gone, oh, wow, this has really grown my knowledge, chucking all these videos up. Um, I think, I think I had a bit of a base from the teaching days because you'll never understand something quite like when you've got to teach it and when you've got 30 year nine kids who do not care. And <laughs> That's true. Just That's like really true. Rapid, rapid fire questions. And so you sort of prepare for those questions. So you start mm-hmm. thinking about how you're going to explain something and then you think, well, what are the questions that might arise from that? And you've got to sort of preempt those yeah. questions so then you can answer them. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a different level of understanding. Like I, I remember doing like a biology cell division or something in, at school and it's like your eyes glaze over and you go, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." and you do sort of rote learning and, and, you know, you, you do well enough to do the exam and it's basically, you learn something for a couple of months and then, and then it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's totally gone. Whereas you, you, you're right. It's you understand it on a far deeper level when you've got to explain something. Um, so now it's like, yeah, cell division, let's go. Can, can talk through that yet. Didn't really care about it back in the day. Yes. And so I think that there's, there's definitely things like, like that, that have sort of stuck with me, but I think being able to explain um, one video I'm filming is spray calibration. So yep. cali- calibrating your sprayer and it's, it's the last thing that I've got to do. I've got my chemical spray license. I've done all the theory and literally all I have to do is film. You would think that I would be okay at that filming a video on spraying the, the chemical. And it's, it's hard when you've got to explain it to someone, you want it to be simple. And then you go, that was a really long winded way of doing that but then yeah when you sort of mark out your area you spray it you time how long it takes or you know and you and you come up with things like that you you find better ways of doing things as well um but i, I think the big one would probably be the irrigation audit that was something that i didn't really truly understand um yeah. until until i had a good go at that and until i did it a couple of times and sort of took data one of the things that I learned about retic way later than I should have, or well, irrigation, you know, we call it retic over here. Where about are you based as well? I'm in Queensland. Yeah, I thought I thought you were. So there's not that much irrigation. Yeah, well, there is. It exists, but you guys get a lot more rainfall, and so you know, in WA, it's like if you want anything to survive, like you need, you know, unless it's the most hardy native or a succulent or a cactus. Like, cause we, I've thought about this many times, people are getting sick of it, but we had 1.6 mil of rain between November and March last year. It was like November 20th to March 16th or something. That was it. Total rainfall. So it was like, you know, so, so a lot of people have irrigation here. So you would think that I would have a lot of knowledge of it. And it took me a lot longer to even realize that sprinklers don't spray evenly. You know, like if you got a, a pop-up sprinkler with a circle, it's like, the water coverage is not flat and even between that. And then, you know, if the pressure is down or the pressure you know, is too low, it, it, well, more problems happen. Like gear drives especially. You know, I remember I, um, when I was working at school once, they had a, 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 a pressure issue and so the sprinklers were still running and we came back after a week off or whatever it was and there was all these 
basically targets on the oval well it looked like massive crop circles where you know right next to the sprinkler was a nice big dot and then there was a circle around it where the sprinkler had been just sort of throwing like a hose instead of spraying nice and evenly and the whole oval was just filled with all these sort of eyeballs dot circle things across the entire thing i was like man the aliens have come (laughs) show we'll show them to the leader (laughs) but but, you know, things like that, I was like, oh, I never thought about that before. You know, if you don't have your pressure right, you know, you're going to get uneven coverage and stuff. It's a lot more technical and complicated than just let's put this sprinkler, screw it into the end of this pipe and walk away, you know, laughing sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. We um we did not long after um, I gave birth, as, as most women do, I'm sure, a couple of weeks after giving birth, they decide to put in a sprinkler system um like yeah, a DIY. Every, <laughs> everyone does that Standard. i thought it was a rite of passage for motherhood yeah <laughs> yeah so i don't know sometimes i come up with really stupid ideas but <laughs> that was probably that was probably one of the worst ones um but yeah the things that you learn and, and like how to design it and then how to how to make sure you are getting that even coverage and that you know the head-to-head coverage and yep and that whole thing and then matching them so that they all have the same rate how to split them into zones um, yes. and what you can and can't run yeah it was a learning curve um we were lucky that we did a pretty good job we hit, hit a couple of stormwater pipes during the trenching <laughs> process but nothing else too bad all as well that ends well no no at least uh, think... the electrical was actually buried the correct depth so we were good <laughs> yeah that's good Man, I uh, I was talking to on one of the podcasts we did with um, Travis from the Lawn Lab up in Bundaberg. He was saying that they just nicked some important pipes one day. Ne- never cut through it, but that's, you know, they got lucky there. Um, my, my biggest thing that I see here uh, with clients, which is so frustrating, is a lot of people have MP rotators, you know, the <clears throat> style of, yeah, of spring club. That's what I had, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, there's a lot of benefits to them, really popular, quite expensive though. And so what people do is, well, for those who don't know, who are listening, they're like the sprinklers that are like normal pop-ups, but they've got sort of like lines of water, like almost like fingers of water that spin around, not a, a fine, even mist. And um, anyway, they're rotators or whatever, they're MP rotators is what they're known as. And uh, they're about $14 for a nozzle or something like that, somewhere in that ballpark. And a normal pop-up novel, it can screw onto the same sprinkler body and it's $3. And it's so common for clients of ours, something goes wrong and they just cheap out and they buy the cheap one. And the flow rate between the two is so different. You get way more water per minute from a normal style of pop-up. So you end up getting these patches that just grow like crazy because they're getting twice as much water. And that sprinkler is stealing all the pressure from the rest of them. So the rest of the lawn looks really average. And then the client's like, I don't know what's going wrong with my lawn. And it's like, man, if you just, that that $11 you tried to save, yeah. you know, if you just didn't try and save that $11 and you, you put it back in, it's like you would have a nice even coverage on the lawn. And they're like, mind blown, you know. Or someone will put a gear drive sprinkler, you know, they'll just go to Bunnings and they got a gear drive sprinkler over there and an impact sprinkler over there and this over there. And then they're like, oh, you know, I'm losing pressure. So I'm going to add more sprinklers. It's like, my goodness, it becomes a mess. And then they don't want to pay to fix it. And you know, I'm just ranting now, getting grumpy at people I've worked with over the years. <laughs> no, there's, there's certainly like, there's a fine line between the DIY style and then you've got to be ready to accept when you're better off going to pro- to a professional, like you were talking before about the lawn renovations. And so, so often you have a look and especially depending on what machines people have available to hire, quite often you probably spend the same amount or less, as you say, hiring a contractor and then you're supporting a local business as well. And, and you sort of, you've got that, you've got that relationship, that return business every year and, and that type of thing. And then those exactly. people are usually the ones who are placed that can say, from this point, here's how you look after your lawn. And then you've got that person so you can sort of go back and forth with. So yeah, while whilst I love the DIY aspect and the DIY side, and I don't want to discourage anyone at a certain point, if you're if you're questioning yourself, 
that should probably be your answer. If you've got no money and you've got a lot of time, then that's when, because the DIY, especially now on the internet, you can learn just about everything. You know, you can learn how to design a good sprinkler system. You may be able to pay a shop to design it for you or some shops will do it for free if you buy the products from them, you know, and then installing it. Yeah, but like there's some people who they're just being tight. They've got the money, you know, and Mm. they don't want to spend time researching it either and then they'll go and do it themselves. So it's the worst of both worlds, you know, because you haven't got the knowledge because you haven't spent a couple of hours looking up YouTube videos and all sorts of stuff. And then they'll dig their pipe as, as shallow as possible and then somebody comes along with an aerator or something, you've got holes in it and yeah, and it's yeah. things like that. Or or another thing that um really like really basic stuff like um do you know you know about articulated risers? Um that you can go yeah. So for those who are who are listening and maybe unaware <clears throat> You know, there's one, the cheapest way to put a sprinkler on a pipe is just to screw it in to the pipe, right? Which is fine for most applications. But if you're going to say drive on the lawn or like right next to the driveway, you can put something which is called an articulated riser. Google it, it's hard to explain, but basically it creates a flexibility within the the riser that the, the sprinkler is sitting on. So you can drive on it and it won't snap the nipple or the riser. <clears throat> and they're about... $11, $10 or something like that. And a really good business, wherever there's a chance something's going to be driven on or if you're doing right on lawn mowing with a really big mower or whatever, they will install it in such a way that you're, you're not going to break the pipe. I remember at a retirement village that somebody had cheaped out and we would break a sprinkler maybe every cut or every second cut simply because of how it was installed and we're not there – they were installed straight into the pipe and the pipe was dug basically as shallowly as possible. Mm-hmm. And so the sprinkler is sticking out, let's say, I don't know, half a centimetre, two millimetres. So you don't notice it, but a 400 kilo ride on with a 100 kilo bloke on top of it drives over it, snapped. The riser snapped. Yeah. You know, and you can't dig the pipe lower without digging out the whole pipe and just cutting corners on the little things like that. That's yeah. where an experienced head will come in and save you so much pain. And so, yeah, I totally get I mean, I love DIYing myself and being a huge benefit to it. But there is definitely a line where you're like, mm, I'm better off paying. It's actually cheaper over a five-year period of time. If you've got the money, you should do it, you know? So Yeah, sort of – um you know, poor man pays twice type thing. If you try and sort of cheap out at some point, you're probably going to have to pay more than if you just did it properly the first time. Just like people who um, build new homes and it's and it's so frustrating because, and I totally get it because I've been in that position as well. You build your home and you've pretty much extended your budget and then it comes down to your lawn, like the last, the icing yep. on top and then you skimp out on prep or you don't scrape back and bring in new fill or or under turf oh, yeah. do any, do anything and it's but then they'll spend eighteen dollars a square meter on a turf variety. It doesn't matter yes. how yes. how amazing <laughs> that turf variety is, it's not going to grow unless you do the prep. Like you'd be better off doing the prep and oh, know, using it for a while or sprigging um like finding a way to 100%. recoup that money. Uh, but yeah, that's probably one of the biggest ones I've seen. And then it beca- you've just inherited that headache for the next however long that you live there and you want to grow a nice lawn. You're going to be trying to rectify that, throwing money at that every year. Like every spring reno, you're going to have to do more. So yeah, that that's the way that I see it the most, especially here with, with new builds. It's just every single new build, unfortunately. Well, that's where we get all our money from as a business, to be honest. Like new bills, cutting corners, going to problems and saying, I need someone to help me. <laughs> like, okay. So in one sense, you're like, you know, do more of it. We'll make more money. <laughs> but you know, the other side of it is with, with trees and stuff, like you're talking about like skimping on, on lawn uh, prep and then buying the most expensive style of lawn if it's going to solve those problems. We've had it mm. before where people will, and we don't do a whole lot of landscaping, right? We're mainly maintenance. And, um, like when we quote to do, to plant some plants, right? You could just 
let's say you've got like a 20 centimeter pot, you know, so like a you know fairly well-established pot, you want to be digging like a 50 or 60 centimeter hole, right? Because yeah. you don't know, I mean, in WA it's very sandy, but there's areas where you, maybe there's a bit of rock around there. Um, you can dig in some good organic matter, all that sort of stuff. And there's a saying that you're better off putting a $1 plant in a $10 hole than a $10 plant in a $1 hole. And it's really quite interesting because what people will do Obviously, the bigger the plant, the more expensive the plant is. So let's say they go get this jacaranda tree for $200, and that's the max of their budget, and they've schemed out on their own landscaping. And so they've got the cheap landscaper who puts this expensive tree in because they want it nice and big. Well, in six months' time, it hasn't really grown. Whereas if you've got the $70 tree and spent $130 on the whole, you've spent the right amount of money, and in six months' time, it's probably the same size as the tree that you bought. And in a year's time, it's bigger. And in five years' time, it's just way better. And it's it's you're not saving yourself money. You know, you, you'd be way better off spending all your money on prep and then getting tube stock. And in five or yeah. six years, you at least have this beautiful, beautiful property and you're not spending all this time maintaining it than you would be spending all this money on plants. And they're just pot bound and the roots are struggling and there's just rocks everywhere so the water is getting heated up you know all that sort of stuff so common seeing that all the time you know yeah we had we we did that same thing when we were building we moved um in with my my in-laws and they have acreage in a greenhouse and we did exactly that like i wanted the japanese fox hedges awesome like we had our vision and we wanted teddy bear magnolias and we had you know our real vision what we wanted our gardening and landscaping to look like and we also were part of like a covenant and it had to be one and a half meter tall tree and they, well, they would come along and actually measure it yeah, so wow. that you could get so that you could get your bond back but yeah we got tube stock and hundreds of um little yeah japanese box hedges and we'd like pot them out and then over the year or so it took to build yeah we you know seaweed and everything and and by the time we moved in we just got the biggest plants and put them in the front yard so the backyard was the one that was sort of needed to develop a bit more but yeah we got our covenant bond back (laughs) so our our teddy bear our teddy bear was at the one one and a half meters but um yeah much better way of doing things and then it enabled us to spend more money on a really reputable landscape company yeah, and they they brought it like I couldn't fault them and you know you know how sometimes we can be where you sort of watch over you know you don't have the time personally to do something but you sort of watch everything um and they yeah. were their, their attention to detail was so good and and yeah that that house every now and then I do a drive-by because I miss my old lawn um and and I just check and those gardens still look amazing and it's because of the prep that was done yeah well the people who live there now are benefiting from your you know, it's your detail. You could have cut corners, you know. You don't you live there anymore. But you know, <laughs> why put the effort in? No, nah, I understand. Look, I'm going to start bringing this episode to a wrap. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to ask one more thing then. Where, where is everything going to go for you in the future? What are your goals with Real Solutions? What are your goals with the YouTube? Are you going to try and take over the world? You know, evil plans. you got some big weapons or something. I don't know. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> a... Um, I... I think as long as as long as it's fun, I'm going to keep going. I think that's my motto with sort of anything I do. If it's not fun, don't do it. So if I find something that's no longer enjoyable, no longer filling my cup, I won't keep doing it. Um, but ultimately, it's I, I'm really interested. I'm a bit of a turf nerd. I'm really interested in the turf plot aspect of it and seeing the different varieties that are out now. I think that's really exciting where where things are going with new varieties especially when they're sort of you know making them have all the characteristics that are going to suit the australian climate i i think that's mind-blowing like i think they're talking about taking drought qualities from wheat and then going and putting that into turf varieties in the us where they're sort of breeding these new hybrids and stuff i i find that really interesting and i sort of want to replicate my end goal if i had all the money in the world I would like to replicate proper turf trials. Like I, I would love to have a poly tunnel. I'd love to be that weirdo with little three That's meter cool. turf plots all around. Um, and, and sort of, yeah, see, can I replicate that? And 
what does it mean for people in Queensland as well so that people can see the different varieties side by side. Well, you've done stuff with Lawn Solutions, so I'm sure you've chatted with Joe a few times, right? Yeah. Because we had him on the podcast as well and, you know, that little spot they've got there with all the little test stuff. Have you been able to go there to their little test site? I haven't been, I haven't been able to go there, but I've seen – I've seen the photos and stuff. Joe actually came here and had a look because um, he's obviously quite passionate about that side of things too. So, you know, yeah. when, when you find someone else with that passion, you have a bit of a have a bit of a chat to them. There's not many of us. Um, yeah, but, all six but of yeah, us. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I just think it's so. I think it's so cool because it's you can sort of explain things, and it's yeah, it's it's mind blowing what they're able to do with turf varieties now, but. Even just the, the stories of how they get turf here is just crazy. And it ends up in this tiny little thing that's, you know, grown in customs for however long and they can't get their hot little hands yep. on it. And then, and then they finally get it. And you can imagine the stress they would be under taking that back to then plant it out. And all they've got is like this six inch little, I, yeah, it's just crazy. And, and then you, um, now we've got hectares and hectares of it in turf farms yeah. and it's all come from that little sample. See, you can tell I'm getting excited. I'm so excited <laughs> about it already. So you this get, is where my sort of passion is. So You hit Joe up for a job, you know. Like, <laughs> you need some testers here in Queensland, I believe. <laughs> you know, send me, some, send me some special varieties. Yeah, I mean, I've got to wrap this up in a second, but did you – uh, go listen to the episode that we did with Joe if you haven't already because he tells the story of how he almost killed the entire country's supply of tiff tough. I don't know if you've ever heard that story before. No, he I talked haven't. about it with Brenton too once, so it's not an exclusive story, but he said basically they just brought it in and they were first starting out with this trial and uh, they went away for the weekend and came back and realized the sprinklers weren't working and it was in a hot house and it was a hot weekend and it was baking it and yeah, he was like, good thing it was a drought tolerant variety because they were able to adjust yeah. bring it back. Yeah. But that's they would spent all this money bringing it into the country and they yeah. only just got it in and everything like that. And they were like, oh, my goodness, we almost lost it. And you'd I was, ne- you'd it was, never live it down either. I was like, I was asking him because he told me the story and he, he said he was a part of it, right? And I was like, so who was responsible for that? And he was like, oh, me. Yeah, like, you know. So, <laughs> Oh, that was good. Anyways, let's wrap this up. I've had a lot of fun. Um, we this is an hour and a half. We've smashed through it like it was fifteen seconds. Nice. <laughs> what? Uh, so people can jump on Lawn Care Australia is your YouTube, right, and your Instagram. That's it. Yep. And your business is Real Solutions. So if you've got cylinder mold parts that you need, you want a funky front roller that's grooved, not flat and boring <laughs> like the rest of the world, and you want to you know, show off to your friends by the, <laughs> the, the grooves on your front roller, there's, there's other benefits to it, people. But it doesn't yeah, they're definitely going to make friends by doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you have no friends and you want friends and you don't even have a cylinder mower, go buy a grooved roller from, <laughs> from Real Solutions. <laughs> What an anyway, <laughs> I know it's it's totally true as well. It's like in Napoleon <laughs> Dynamite when Pedro's like, "If you vote for me, what is it? Yeah. all of your dreams will come true." <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> Anything else we want to say before we sign off, Emma? Ah, uh, no, just thank you, thank you for having me, and uh, yeah, thank you to anyone who currently watches or has watched, or if not, make sure you like and subscribe. Exactly. If you've come to the end, you've done well here. If you've never seen Emma's stuff, you're going to like it. So jump on there and we'll see you guys in the next podcast.